So why don't we get started? I would love for each of our panelists uh, to um, tell us a little bit about themselves. And um, we're gonna get started that way. And why don't we start with, uh, why don't we start with uh, Mike? Uh, hey everybody, happy Friday. Um, I'm Mike Halderson. Um, I'm a singer songwriter here in, in uh, Minneapolis. Um, I generally just go by Haldy um, uh, and that's what I record music under as well. Uh, I, you know, play out and about uh, kind of in the Twin Cities area. I also book music for uh, a winery in um, southern Minnesota called Jankaska Creek Winery. Uh, we are excited to hopefully open our doors here in a couple of weeks uh, to get some people in there. Um, as far as recording goes, this is my uh, my little home studio setup. I am not a professional by any means. Uh, I have some ideas on uh, what works for me in a uh, limited space, limited budget kind of thing. So I kind of feel like that would be my 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 wheelhouse here today is to to offer some opinions as to uh, how to make your own space work for you in the recording process um, that way. So um, I guess that's it. Great, uh, Leslie, uh, would, would you tell us about yourself? Hi, um, thanks for inviting me here today. Um, yeah, my name is Leslie Braden, and I'm primarily a musician, but I make my music with my recording studio as my main instrument, pretty much. Um, I've been doing audio engineering off and on for probably about 20 years, um, and a musician earlier than that. So um, even though I did take like a two-year degree in audio engineering a long time ago, uh, I mainly just use it for my own music. And then I do some engineering for people here and there. Like I just finished um, mixing and mastering an EP um, for someone who I think is my connection through here. Uh, her name's Rochelle Lene, and she is in Tacoma, which is where I am, Tacoma, Washington. Um, so it's two hours earlier here. And um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I do engineering, I do editing. I, I like to collaborate with people a lot. Um, I don't play out a lot, except in other people's bands. Mostly what I do is recording projects um, as a solo artist, and then I collaborate with my partner. Uh, we have a duo called Fast Arrow, and it's a lot of like electronic new wave mixed with acoustic instruments and things like that. Um, I have a home studio. It's in a little bedroom up here. This is where I do most of my stuff. It's great that I have my own studio because my partner and I have this house together and he has his studio in the basement and it's a little bit more pro. He's actually more of a pro engineer. Um, and it's great cause I get to use his nicer equipment when I need it, but mostly I do everything here and, um, yeah, that's what I do almost every day. I'm in here working. So it's great. Wonderful. Thank you. And Kyle, would you introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Um, Thanks for for letting me be here. Um, I am currently in my professional ish studio, I guess. Um, this is a place about three blocks away from my apartment. So it's a separate place that I walk to every single day. And I've I've been walking to for the last two months, essentially. Uh, so I mean, I've been doing a ton of engineering lately. I mean, there's been a lot more music being written by a lot more of my friends. And I've not only been someone who has been interested in teaching, you know, I'm, I'm a, the mixing and mastering instructor actually at Slam Academy, which is the, the school that I teach at, but I also have a lot of personal projects that I've been doing. So I've been busy, which is a new experience for me, especially in the engineering world. Um, but I've just been having, uh, a lot of fun being able to to be an educator and uh, an artist at the same time. Excellent, thank you. All right, well, my first question for any of the three of you, and feel free to um, to go first, whoever would like to, is, uh, you know, very fundamentally, what software or hardware 
do you recommend using and and why? What is what are some software and hardware you can tell everybody about? Um, I can speak to that if you want, at least starting out. <laughs> um, I have been using Pro Tools for the last 20 years and I love it and I don't want to have to learn anything else because it's a big learning curve to learn any new software. But um, I think that if you're just starting out, um, you might want to consider something else because Pro Tools is on a subscription service now. So it's, I think there's like a monthly or yearly fee to keep going with it. Um, so I think the, the bottom line is to use what's easy for you. Um, what If you know something already, just stick with it. Or if it's something like if you're already using GarageBand, you might want to use Logic because it's kind of a natural progression with Apple. Um, but there's a lot of um, high end software out there and it kind of depends on where you're at. One's not necessarily better than the other. It's really about what you know and what's easy for you to get to. Um, hardware, it's like, <laughs> it's kind of funny. I use a 2009 Mac Pro still and I still have a DigiDesign Digio 3 um, because it's what I have and it still works and it's solid and I'm running Pro Tools 12, which is prior to the subscription service. So, you know, being a musician, you don't usually have a lot of money. And I think you just need to find out what you can afford and talk to some other people who are having a successful home setup and find out what they're using. Um, because it, it can also be a giant rabbit hole to uh, find all the compatibility issues and look at your iOS and what kind of computer you have and um, what kind of hardware you have and make sure everything's compatible. So um, just whatever works and whatever you can afford. I know that's kind of silly, but there's no like answer about what you should definitely get. I, to, to piggyback off that too, uh, Leslie, my audio interface is an RME UFX Fireface, um, which means to get it to plug into my 2017 MacBook Pro, I have to take the fire the firewire 400 into a firewire 800 into a thunderbolt 2 into a thunderbolt 3 cable into my computer so um i can relate a lot to being adaptable um but i'm sure mike is probably gonna gonna say kind of the same thing it is whatever works um i've been doing the the production thing for about 12 years now and it started as a second room of my apartment. I had a two bedroom apartment and one of the rooms in there became my makeshift studio. Actually, almost a carbon copy of what Leslie has behind her. Um, and then I then eventually moved to this kind of big thing. I don't need this. This is just a way for me to be creative in, in a different space that's not my home. I bet the basement that you were talking about, Leslie, is probably pretty similar. And Mike, honestly, I don't, if, if that's your house, uh, that's an impressive home looking studio. So what I hope everyone kind of recognizes is I have this totally separate space, but what Mike has and what Leslie has right now are all perfectly valuable and you can do so much with them. And I use for software, I use Ableton Live, but I also have been using Logic Pro professionally as well. And what Leslie said, I think really is important. If you're someone who's already using GarageBand, Logic Pro for $200, I think is what it costs, is a absolutely professional piece of software. Um, and then there's another free digital audio workstation called Reaper, which some people might be familiar with. Uh, that is actually free as well for testing purposes. So if you're brand new to all of this, there are free solutions that are out there. Um, and then there's some low cost ones uh, as well. Let's see. Yeah, uh, thanks for the compliments on my space. I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, but yeah, you know, and it's, I know it's, sometimes it's frustrating for people to hear um, you know, like shopping for anything. Uh, well, what sounds best to, for you? What like it in it all like and beginners get frustrated because they don't know. They want like we want someone to tell us what to do. Um, 
with the with all this stuff and again it's very confusing i remember you know 100 years ago and i'm like trying to find a guitar well does it feel good to you i don't know i'm not good enough to know if it feels good or not so there's some people that are in that phase where you're like just tell me what to buy but it doesn't we're probably not going to get that here <laughs> for me personally i use a little uh, focus right uh, usb audio interface um, and i love it it's super easy it works well. I'm a, I'm on a PC running Windows 10, uh, and I literally, you know, plugged it in and started working. My software, not many people use it. It's a, it's called the Mixcraft is the name of it, um, and and I like it. I I, I bought it years ago, um, and I've just kind of upgraded it every time they come out with a new version because I got used to using it. And I went. I think I might have tried one of the other like free trials on some other software but again it was so unfamiliar and i felt like at the stuff that i was doing didn't really merit a, learning a whole new system for maybe not a whole lot um of, of trade-off in any kind of increased quality um but for mine it's a like acoustica mix craft i like it the the screen is uh, the, the the channel bar they're all larger there's no little tiny little buttons to click on which used to drive me I'm like wait that, that like you know there's on some of these softwares there's like one little tiny button that you can't even really see and you got to click on that and that changes everything and i'm just like i know i want something big that's like emergency button or you need to do this so mixcraft has worked um really well for me in that regard um my space is in an unfinished, we, we moved, we have a, a one story house with a huge basement and I, there are no walls here, right? Like this, those are curtains and it's, it's a 20 to 300 square foot big old basement and I just hung curtains up and the wall that's back there is leaning up against uh, an I-beam. It's not, it's not a wall. I was doing some live streaming work and I wanted it to look different. So I put that in there and I, I you know, you fooled me. Like, what's that? You definitely fooled me. Yeah. <laughs> Outstanding. But, but that's all it was for. I, my buddy's a, uh, he plays in a jazz duo and they wanted to come over and do some video work as well. So, you know, it's just, it's essentially a backdrop, but honestly it just makes me feel better when I'm looking at it and doing that. So I kind of have my front facing setup that records things behind me and I create a lot of content that way too, which is, it's just kind of a nice uh, touch. So yeah, it's nothing fancy. I thought uh, there's another rabbit hole you can go down with uh, soundproofing. And I mean, it's just like, it, you know, that's thousands of dollars to do it. And so I found like a high pass filter uh, does the job right? Like for my, like I got, it's kind of a little noisy basement and there might be a, a vent somewhere on and I, I can turn on my condenser mic here and I can look at the little green bar that comes up that's showing it's picking up noise. And then I set a filter to, to, to lower that thing down. And it, I mean, that does it for me as far as working in a kind of a noisy room, simple little adjustments like that have made the difference. So anyway, that was a lot of talking. Sorry. <laughs> oh, go ahead, Leslie. I had uh, a really important thought, I think, and especially right now during the stay at home orders is that if you're collaborating with people, um, especially like if your band is working and you're swapping sessions, you know, working on a song together and you can't be physically together, um, it's really important that you, you think about the compatibility of your softwares together. Um, I, if you, if someone has logic and I have pro tools, it's usually not a problem. Like the EP I just mixed, she was using logic. Um, when she bounced out her tracks, they were seamless when they came over and I used them in pro tools. But if you're going back and forth a lot collaborating, um, and you want to use the same session, um, you might want to use the same software with the people you're working with. To speak to that too, I I have I have used several pieces of music software over the course of my career. Um, some more than others. You know, most of my personal production I do in Ableton Live, but I still routinely use Logic Pro for film stuff. Um, and then learning other software, like I did a sound design for a video game, so I had to learn FMOD, which is a popular framework for. Uh, video games. So 
learning one is really important, but recognizing that you're going to, especially as you do this more professionally, you'll have to learn some other softwares, like Leslie said, just for compatibility's sake. Great. I wanted to give you all a moment to respond because I think I jumped on a couple of your comments there. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, but, you know, I have another question and that is, um, you know, what are uh, the tips and tricks you recommend when using any of these systems for home recording and what are optimal ways to maximize quality? Uh, I'll I'll hop in just quick. You know, I don't have uh, too many tips or tricks. I do pretty simple things. The thing I mentioned prior was the just the high pass filter to get rid of room noise for me works really well. There may be different ways to do that. Um, I mean, it's, it could be as simple as loading up an EQ and uh, lowering the the bass levels, you know, under 80 hertz or 100 hertz or something like that. And that that seemed to cut out a lot of that um, for me. And then, um, you know, it could be turning down the gain on your microphone, um, like is another piece that'll do that same thing, right? Like, it's like, Oh God, I get all this noise. We'll turn your mic down, <laughs> you know, and, and then you can, you can get in a little closer and you can eliminate a lot of it for me that way. And a, a lot of it's just, you know, noise in my room. That's a thing I've been trying to, trying to manage. Um, but so those are like, and then um, also gain for me, like I want it to be loud. And so my tendency starting out was to, to push that gain to, to get it to a nice level right away when I recorded it. And I, I have had to back that off to, you know, I don't know, negative 10 dB or negative, like somewhere. So it's just lower. And then when I go back in and if I add compression and EQ and some of that stuff, then and then all other tracks together, the whole, all of a sudden I'm I'm right up at the level that I want to be at. Um, so I I've tried to resist the the uh, temptation to get everything at the at the peak level right away because I wanted to sound great right away and have some patience with it as it goes. And then the other stupid thing, right, is like turn my headphone level up. <laughs> you know because like it's a weird it's weird because you're sitting there and you're like well okay my gain uh, that needs to be higher but I can't hear it oh well I'll just turn my <laughs> literally turn my headphones up <laughs> you know and it's like a thing I never just it never considered and so that makes it easier to do that I don't know anyway those, those are just a couple things that off the top of my head yeah the uh um like what you're listening back, that's a, a huge deal. Um, <laughs> I, I think that when you're recording at home versus in a recording studio, you're, you're going to have to accept that, you know, you're not, you're not paying the big bucks for the room and you can do everything you can to minimize your reflections in your room, like putting a rug down and covering up the windows and things like that. But you're going to have to accept some noise, but I mean, Homes are kind of noisy, if, even if you don't have people in the house with you, which you often do, or neighbors. Um, you know, you got like the heat or the air conditioning coming on. So usually if I'm about to track vocals, I'll like turn the thermostat off um, just so it doesn't kick on while I'm doing that. Or you, you might need to unplug your refrigerator, you know, turn off, like don't do laundry or, or run the dishwasher or things like that you might not think of right away until you end up with stuff like that in your recording. Um, also, your listening environment is probably not going to be great. Um, I'm okay with that. I, this is, I haven't really treated my room for listening, and yet I still do mixing in here. And I know the room, so I feel pretty comfortable with it. But I also listen in multiple places. Like, once I think I have a mix really good, I will take it into the living room, and I'll listen on the stereo there. I'll listen in my car. That's a huge deal. Um, I'll listen on a laptop speaker I'll listen on my phone um, just if, if you know you don't have the best monitoring environment or the best monitors um, do all you can to try to um, listen in different ways sometimes I'll turn the volume way down on the monitors um, and hear what is too loud like you don't even realize that something is too loud until you turn 
the monitor is almost completely off and you're like, wow, that tambourine is ridiculous, you know? So um, I would say definitely um, your listening environment is a big deal if you're mixing your music to, um, to just accept that it's not perfect and do whatever you can to uh, listen in a lot of different ways. Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I was going to say too, I agree exactly with what Leslie said, being able to listen to the, your music in different environments alleviates the stress of not being in a perfectly acoustic treated environment, which let's be honest, not many of us ever are going to get a chance to do that. So being able to utilize what it is that you have very well ends up being better than trying to throw as much money as at the problem as you possibly can. Um, just recognize that learning the environment that you're in is more important than being in a perfect environment. And by listening to your songs in multiple places, you can get a sense for how your song sounds in that room and how it will truly be represented across other spaces. So that ends up being good. My biggest tip, aside from what Mike said with gain staging really properly, um, is always the simpler the, the, the setup is, the better. Um, because if you can get a simple setup working, then you can add more stuff to it. So even just something as simple as like a good quality microphone stand, make sure that you're in a space that can be uh, treated if you want to treat it later on. You know, you can be in the corner of a room or something. Um, those blankets that Mike has in his basement, those are great. Even just something as simple as that. You don't have to go perform crazy amounts of construction to get a good quality sound. It can be very simple things that you can do. Um, you, you don't have to go crazy with the budget. So just you know, if you can find some like egg crate foam or something like that, uh, those are, are great to put up or blankets or quilts or even rugs. Um, take advantage of simple, of simple things before you go and spend a bunch of money. I got a, I got a follow up real quick, Kyle. Um, those are curtains, not blankets. Okay. It's a high class room down here. We don't, not going to do blankets. <laughs> Um, uh, in our basement studio, uh, my partner, he rigged a really cool cheap thing where he got some like panels of rock wool or some kind of insulation at Home Depot and then like sewed it inside some moving blankets and he's able to like hang them up on the ceiling and kind of create little mini sound booths. Like, um, if I want to go down there and do vocal tracking and use his nicer microphones, um, they, they create this great dampening. It's, and it's like, a, I think he just, you know, saw it on a, something on the internet, like a trick for that. Um, and it's something that's homemade and works great to keep the reflections down. Yeah, I, I threw a little thing in the chat here um, as I've been sheltering at home, looking for a project to do. I've been kind of putzing around with that same idea. And I've seen people make them out of the little one inch PVC pipes and just assemble a little skeleton, however big you want to put it. And then it's moving blankets and the insulation. And my, my plan is just to, just to put my condenser mic in there, turn it up and just experiment with what comes up on the volume levels compared to the room and see if it makes a difference. And, you know, I have a friend that owns a moving company, so I get the blankets for nothing and the PV it's probably a $25 experiment or something. And we'll, you know, we'll see how it goes, but. Um, we've actually used one of those in one of the other studios in this space here. Um, it wasn't PVC. We used a coat rack, um, <laughs> but we, we did that. We draped up a, a heavier blanket over the top of the, the frame and put it in side of like a little space. And it actually did a pretty good job of, of deadening the, the, the area just a little bit. And then you do that. And we have one of those, um, tiny little microphone isolator shields. I mean, you put that inside of a space where you have a, uh, a blanket or something on a, a coat rack. It doesn't even have to be PVC because the coat rack has wheels. So it even becomes better. 
Um, cause that's a, that's something that's, that makes life so much easier, but just something as simple as that you're 60 to 70% of the way to what a professional studio would sound like. And then there's diminishing returns as far as value goes, trying to get to that hundred percent. Yeah. I, um, another thing I remembered, I wanted to talk about with, um, listening in your, in your compromised room is to listen to other music in your room, like especially stuff that you want it to sound like. So pick some reference tracks and make sure you're kind of like A-Bing, flipping between them while you're working and you'll get a good idea of what's wrong and what's right with your room, but you can at least kind of match um, what you want it to sound like. So um, yeah, you can just have that ready on your, your phone or whatever, like on an aux cable and you can flip between them and make sure you're getting a good sound um, and it, it makes up for the lack of monitoring situation for sure. Great, thank you. Well, as you can see, I have a little bit of background uh, folks in the background here too. Um, yeah. But uh, my next question for the panel is, um, how does no. uh, home recording factor into creating engaging content for your no. fan base? Uh, both things that you've done and tactics you have seen successfully and implemented by other uh, musicians. Well, I know that um, for myself, I've been doing a ton of streaming lately. So as an educator, especially in the electronic music world that I'm in, uh, my transition to online teaching was pretty quick. Um, I've been streaming on Twitch for about five years now. Um, and it all kind of just started off as people would ask me questions about like, how do I do this? Or how do I set up my, you know, uh, recording workflow for my vocals or how do you treat this? And eventually it just turned into me being like, I'm going to make music on a Saturday and I'll stream myself doing it. And then I can communicate with people. So that has driven me to make my background look even cooler uh, as time has gone on. Um, but the advantage of that is I get to interact with a lot more cool devices and tools that I get to use and show and educate people about and warn them not to spend, I'm afraid to say how much money I've spent on the things inside of this room. Um, but really, it's not about anything that I have. It's just about understanding how all of it works. So I get to, to be this person who gets to share what it is I do every day and answer questions and, and be uh, helpful and contribute to the community. So my recording studio has uh, improved as I've been able to help more people. So the streaming thing is is like, one of the most fun things that I get to do. So being able to, to share that with people is like my favorite part about wanting to even learn about home recording in the first place. Cause I'm definitely not a singer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but being a professional artist means getting a good uh, recording workflow in place. Um, and now that I've got that, I get to help everyone else sound a little bit better every day. Um, I actually need to get on this bandwagon. I, <laughs> I would love to learn more about like streaming your workflow and stuff like that. It's been something that's been a, a hurdle. And I think a lot of people a lot of musicians nece don't necessarily want to go there because they like to do things in person. And it's also this whole layer of technology on top of what you're already doing, you have to worry about. Um, but it's something I've really been wanting to learn about. And I, I think, you know, one of the silver linings of what everybody's going through is that we're having to learn more technology. This is the first time I've ever done this kind of a uh, Zoom setup with questions and a webinar type of thing. And you know, it's, it's just part of the future. Um, so I haven't done a lot of that, but I've definitely been tuning in to some of my favorite artists doing regular live streams. Um, and then they're doing things like attaching Patreon accounts to stuff like that. Um, making 
special content for people who are Patreon donators, um, donors. <laughs> and that's like the music industry is in, just in a free fall right now. And I think everybody's trying to figure out how to maintain their fans and how to keep trying to try to bring in some money somehow. <laughs> Um, and maybe look to the future because I don't know if the industry is going to go back to where it was. Hopefully some things will, will change that are for the better. Um, so this might be another one of those steps where musicians are able to take more control and get more engaged with their fans directly. Um, it's like a whole new frontier. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, the, the workflow comment that, um, Leslie and Kyle made like doesn't even it starts with your audio interface and being able to come into your space and flip on a switch and to be recording like that like to, to have that whatever your space is you do not want to have the, the creative lightning bolt and have to mess with cables and power and software updates and so all of those things and this is such a good time to do that to so, okay, you got your audio interface and it's already plugged in and your mic's already on your workstation and you can open your software and click record and get that, get that idea down. With the current situation in creating content, the, I've done a couple of live streams, I've, I've, uh, which, which I enjoy, it's a weird process, but I did a lot of research on the software. And so I'll use, I use OBS software and Streamlabs software. And it's, it, there's a learning curve there um, to do that. Um, but what they allow, which I, which I have really liked is to, you don't have to stream live to use them. So basically what happens now, because a lot of people, you know, introverts like me um, don't want to do a first live stream without knowing what that looks like and sounds like. And so some of these softwares I can come down and now that they're all set up, I click two or three buttons and I can just record. And then I look at the video and I look for, God, what is the, what does the lighting look like? Oh my, what does my face look like? You know, how's the audio? And I, I really like the audio thing for me has been a challenge um, because when you, when you live stream, you can only use, and maybe you guys have different experiences, but I've kind of tried to figure it out, but there's only really one or two inputs that you get in an audio interface that allow your streaming software to pick it up. So if you have a 20 channel audio interface, only two of those are gonna go to your streaming software. So then if you've got any other things that you wanna add, that's a, that's a piece that you have to manage. So then I was able to, I have a little Bose PA that I use when I go play my gigs, which is great. And so I've taken that mixer, the little T1 mixer, and then routed all of it out to my audio interface and I love it. So I come down, I click that on, I click the interface on and I can either stream live or record video in 30 seconds. It doesn't take me long to get it all. And to just to have that has helped me a ton in my songwriting and in, in what the songs are like, Oh God, I got this idea. Hang on. And I go down, click, click, and I'll record the thing. And it's great. So in addition to the, you know, the, software hardware thing just to have a workflow that you can come and sit into and just start recording is key but but so I create a lot of content I'll so I'll make a do a video and I'll just have a new song and I will talk directly to my email subscribers I'm like hey everybody th you know what I appreciate you being on the email list here's this tune that I'm working on right now and it might be half done and I sit there and I make a two minute it takes me two minutes and I send it to them and I really, really like doing that because I will uh, agonize over what to write people, what to post, how often do I do it. But when I, I feel like if I have my space, then it takes my brain out of, do, I, oh, I'm just going to come down and play this and do it. And before I thought about it, five minutes later, I've sent like a cool little clip of a song to my email subscribers or I'll post it somewhere or send it up to YouTube or whatever. So workflow wise that's that's what i like and that's what this kind of the hardware software combo that i have has allowed me to do that's really cool um i also want to uh <laughs> agree with that situation of having your studio just ready to go um 
whether it's streaming or recording. Um, as I mean, it's great to be able to pay an engineer and they're specialists and that's why we pay the money when we go to a studio and we can stay as musicians and just keep our music hat on and somebody else can deal with the cables that aren't working and the software update or the crash that just happened. Um, but when you're doing both of those things, it's it can just kill your inspiration um, if you go to work and you have to track down like a cable that's not working. Um, that can just, you can just be like, screw it and not work. Or uh, back, I used to share a, a little home studio with my partner. Now we have separate spaces, which is just like a godsend because we have different workflows and he would work on something and then I'd come down another day and try to work and he'd have everything patched differently and I'd have to like plug in everything, figure out where the inputs were. And uh, by the time I did that, I the last thing I wanted to do was make music. So um, that's a big hurdle to think about when you're having a home studio and you might want to invest like separate time. Like, you know, don't try to wear both those hats at the same time. Um, if you have a day where there's software updates happening, do not plan on making music that day. You're going to probably be bogged down in downloads and then find out that you start your software up and now a plugin that you used to use doesn't work anymore and you have to go update that. So, um, yeah, don't try to do that on a day when you're planning on being creative. Um, just be okay, like stopping and and uh, saying, I'll be creative another day, I gotta do this. So that's something I wanted to bring up before and that's, I'm glad you brought that up, Mike. And and to to go a little bit further, I this is something I actually teach most of my students, especially the ones that kind of are the beginners is I wear a different hat basically every day. You know, my six days a week here, each day is spent doing a different task. And because of that, I, my ability to generate content tends to be much faster than it ever was when I was just like, oh, I'll just do it whenever. Um, you know, by having this schedule kind of set up in place. So, you know, my Monday or my day one of a project is just my creative workflow. So that's my hat. I like that you use the hat analogy because that's what I use all the time is by thinking differently for each day about what my focus is allows me to get better at each of those things individually, but then also create a workflow that leads towards a completed product. You know, Mike had talked, had touched on it earlier about like, you know, just coming down here, getting started, doing something for two minutes and then sending it out. I mean, that should be how your workflow starts. I mean, if you want to get good, if you want to make consistent content, which is so important, especially for myself as an independent artist, I don't have the ability to have a, a marketing team that can just constantly promote whatever it is that I recently released every time I release something or I, I put out music, I have to start planning what my next thing is because I'm a one person, you know, machine basically. Um, so starting is really important. Getting good at starting is important. And then getting good at the next part, which is making the sound sound better, you know, doing sound design. And then it's the mixing hat and then it's the songwriting hat and then it's the other critical mixing hat. You know, you're going to have to wear a lot of hats as an independent artist. You're going to have to learn how to do so much of it. And then as you go up, you can start to maybe start to hand out your work to other people, get a mixing engineer, get a, a mastering engineer, um, whatever you're willing to, to give up um, will come so much later. So enjoy the process now is really the most important part. Great, thank you. Well, I am wondering if anyone, any one of our attendees have uh, questions for the panelists. You can either type those in the chat and we'll give you just a minute to do that. And, um, or you can raise your hand and I, we could unmute you and you could say it um, as well. But we do, it looks like, have a first question. Um, so I'll read that to you all. Uh, it says, I'm about to start recording vocals for our band's album. So far, the instruments are sounding very clean for it being recorded in my room, but I'm nervous that the vocals might sound a little too 
uh, bedroomy compared to the rest of the tracks. What tips would you recommend for recording tighter sounding vocals? I have three thick fiberglass insulation sheets, which may help. Um, well, I, I definitely can kind of repeat almost verbatim what Mike said. Um, as long as you listen for what the bedroom is sounding like, um, you can definitely use some smart EQing techniques to help make it sound a little bit less bedroomy. Um, another thing that is the easiest solution, in my opinion, is some reverb. I mean, just a small amount of, of processing on a microphone of reverb lets you place it in a different space, which is not a bedroom. Um, so even just a subtle amount of reverb can really help it stand out. Um, of course, any, any insulation that you could do um, to inside of your vocal space will make it sound a lot more dead, which allows you to then put more uh, color on it later. Um, but I would just say if, if you try out this EQ technique that Mike had talked about where it's like, just turn up your headphones, listen to what the microphone sounds like without any input, and then EQ that so that it's silent again. And then you can add reverb to it later to make it sound like it's not recorded in your bedroom. Yeah, um, it's mic vocal recording is pretty tough. Um, a lot of times I think too, if, if you're hoping for the the, the raw track to sound like it would in a finished mix. There's a lot of processing that usually ends up on a, on a mix. Um, there's going to be compression and yeah, EQ and reverb delays sometimes. Um, but if you're troubleshooting, like you're actually, you know, having trouble with the, the sound of your room in the microphone, um, definitely play around with like the, the dampening in the room. I know people who do uh, vocals like in their coat closet or in their closet because fabric just like absorbs all the reflections. Um, you might wanna look at your mic and make sure that the pattern is not set to Omni. Um, that happened recently with a project I was working on. And uh, if, it, if, the, if you have like a multi-pattern microphone and it's set on Omni, it's gonna just pick up all the room. So you wanna um, make sure it's on cardioid and be at the right position to pick it up. Um, you might wanna play with how close you are to the microphone um the proximity of it and just some things like that just like play around too with where the mic is in the room um just do some experimenting but yeah i think a lot of things like it'll sound more punchy um the t it'll sound more tight like you said if you put a little bit of compression on there and some reverb and it'll sit better in the mix there's just some tricks you can do so you'll have to play around with that also i don't know what kind of mic you're using if you know, if it's a dynamic mic or a, a cardioid, uh, large diaphragm tube, you know, it's all going to sound a little different. Um, yeah, I'd say about the same thing. You know, for me, it was always like, I think I mentioned turning the mic gain down and getting closer to the mic in addition to the EQ is a, is a place to start. Um, and just trying to, yeah, just trying to get the cleanest sound you can get and then you know affect it later and without i don't think we can get into eq and compression and all that stuff but one and I, and I don't know a ton about it i don't know all the settings and i you know like i know that they they do some cool stuff um but again it's kind of what you like and so one thing i did is that what i would do is i'd take the track and i'd solo the track right so my just just my vocal track now is playing and i'd and i'd loop a section of it and I'd mess around with the EQ and the compression while it was just on a loop. And so even if you don't know what compression does or what EQ is going to do, you can open up that effect in your software and you can subtly adjust the parameters and listen to that loop. And then, okay, come back again. You know what I'm going to, there's always like a power button. You just turn the power on the effect off. Oh, that's, I don't like that. Okay. Let, and so you can, you can do a little reading on what those effects do, but then, really solo the track and loop it and just like, oh, cool, that sounds great. And then you get to pick what you like and it, you don't have to go back and do this. Thing. You know, it, it's, a, it's a streamlined way to figure out what those effects do. And that's just a little trick to make that 
process easier to figure out what kind of effect you like is kind of a thing that you might want to try. Um, and to, to say something similar to what Mike was saying too, when you find that loop, don't be afraid of presets, especially if you don't know everything about how that EQ or that compression plugin works. In all cases, the people that have created those presets usually know what they're talking about. And so they'll tell you like vocal or, you know, uh, thickness or, you know, uh, saturated or something like that. Use those presets. Listen to that loop. Try the preset. If it doesn't sound good, switch to the next preset. Don't forget, just like Mike said, turn off and on the plugin when you listen to it for a loop too. Our ears will get used to something very quickly. Um, and so trying out these presets will help you learn quick ways to help you process your vocals and speed is the should be the most important skill uh that you learn while you're making this stuff the faster that you can do everything the better you can start learning all the other things too i'd like to just jump in one more thing with that the presets are great it's also it's also a way to learn what the effects do so like when you hit a preset it, like on my software, it'll list the four effects that it added to that preset. And I can individually mute each one of those as I go to it. It allows me to learn, oh, that's what, that's what compression does, or that's what the EQ does, or you know what, I don't like this chorusy effect. So I can, within, the, uh, within the, the preset, you can manipulate the sound as well and tweak it a little bit there. And it's just a it gets you further along faster. But that, that's a, a way that I kind of learned what those sounds did when I was first doing it. Wonderful. Okay, well, we have a couple of questions next that are about uh, drums. So I'm gonna actually read both of them together and uh, we'll talk about drums. Um, so the first is any tips for recording drums with limited mic setups and inputs on interface? Can it be done with only two mics and inputs? And the second question is, is it really tricky to record drums? I have a rock band and I want to be able to record us. We have a PA, a mixer, and three or four Shure mics. I just got a Focusrite 2 in 2 out USB audio interface. I only have GarageBand. Can I make it work for my band? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's always the most common question I feel like I get asked, especially when I talk about you know, recording bands and things like that is, well, do you have, you know, 16 drum microphones? And no, I don't. Um, I, I don't think that it's really that necessary. And what I've always learned to do is make the best out of whatever configuration that you have. So if you only have two drum mics, okay, well, then you're probably going to want to try to get, you know, two really good positions for those drums so that you can capture the most of that group of sounds if it's tom drums or, or you know, snares or something like that. Or you just have to do it the way that the pioneers used to do it and record every single track individually or every, you know, group of tracks two at a time. Um, so you could grab maybe the snare and then the kick drum, and then you have to play that recording. Um, it's about the amount of time that you want to invest, but a solid two positional microphone setup can help you capture all of the things in the drum kit that you maybe want. And then maybe just do the kick and snare on their own, depending on whatever it is that you want. Yeah, I think, uh, Drums are super intimidating to me too. And I often pass it on to my bandmate because he's a drummer and he's, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, they're your drums. You've got all these microphones, you do it. But um, I know that the two mic setup, it's common in some genres of music. And I think, you know, one will be an overhead and one will be like out in front of the, the drum set and you won't get stereo, you'll get a mono kit and that's just what you're dealing with. Um, but you know, you'll get the cymbals and you'll get the overall toms and all the sounds and then you'll get the kick drum out front and some different frequencies out front and you'll just have to blend those together and you can totally do it. Um, I mean, I back in a long time ago, I was using, you know, like, like when I was a teenager, like four track cassette, ADAT, um, all I had was like 
a sure SM57, you know, we still made recordings and that's just what you do. Um, and when you start there, that's actually where you get your skills. So um, don't be afraid to just go for it. Um, the, the second question about, yeah, you only have three or four sure mics. Um, and, but you have a mixer. So um, yeah, you can totally do that. I mean, you're not gonna get a, as much high end from the overheads, but if you're not using a condenser, I don't think you'll get kind of a little bit of a more dead sound, but yeah, just put the mics up. Um, you can run it through the mixer. And then since you just have a two in, two out, you'll have to mix them to stereo before you go in. So you'll just get, you'll have to pre-mix your mics. So um, that's a little bit more tricky, but it's totally doable. Uh, I am terrified of recording drums. I don't um, I, like it. It's a you know, and I and I play in a little trio, and there, you know, and we've. Uh, but I do a lot of stuff solo too, so I don't have a ton of experience recording drums. The what I find has happened when I do it is that like the pristine stuff we were talking about earlier, where you get your good direct in with your guitar, and you got it all buttery and it sounds great and then you do a really good job of your vocals and then you record these cantankerous drums and it sounds completely different than what you just recorded with your audio your vocal and your guitar so i've always found a discrepancy between room recorded drums in a non-professional studio and the type of professional sound you can get in your studio with the other things by going directly in. So that's just it. So I've always done the, the drum. I've had other people do the drums and uh, it, you know, and when I, when we record something that's going to be, you know, uh, a record that's going to be done, that's in a studio with the, with the drummer. And so for me personally, with my like solo project, I will do, I'll do the computer drums and I'll, change the velocities on all the hats and the things and I can make it sound like maybe somebody's doing it. But for me, that's a better option. So I'm not much one to talk about mic and drums in a room, but because I find it the, the, the amount of time that that takes me is not, not worth me doing it personally. So. With drums, I mean, you're also, it's impossible to get out of the room. Like if, if you, you know, the, the mics are so far away, you're going to be picking up the room. So if you're in a basement, it's going to sound like a basement. If you're in a church, it's going to sound like a church. Um, you just, you can't really get around that. Um, I mean, with the dry drums, like in a basement, you can add gated fake reverb and that's a sound. And I actually kind of like that sound, but um, you just kind of have to go with what you have. Um, I would say though, with like questions about miking things, um, just get like a couple of books, like, this is, sorry, it's backwards, I think, practical recording techniques. This is like one I got in, in my two-year program or like another one that just kind of gives you all the diagrams for common instruments and where to put things. Um, if you go on forums online, it's gonna be like, uh, everybody's got a very strong opinion about the way they do things and you'll never, you'll just be like, I don't know, I'll, I give up. So, plus everybody's kind of mean on forums and a little bit misogynistic and uh, I would avoid wasting time on forums asking questions <laughs> if you can. So there's a lot of great books. Um, they have super basic stuff and you can't go wrong if you're just starting out doing things like the way they say. Hey Leslie, could you type the name of that book in the chat for us? Cool. Yep. Um, a next question, what are some free or inexpensive plugins you find useful? Um. So I, I can answer this one and also uh, one of the other plugin related questions that I, I saw show up in the chat there. Um, I really like uh, the plugin called Labs by Spitfire Audio. Um, it is a company that specializes in making sample libraries of orchestral sounds. So a sample library is just a, a collection of sounds recorded from actual orchestral performances or instruments or um, drums. Uh, you know, there's a lot of really cool drum sample libraries out there. That's what Mike was referring to as well when he was talking about the drums. Um, but, but Labs by Spitfire Audio is a fantastic free plugin that has a ton of just 
normal organic sounds and then instruments and then not organic sounds and then kind of some interesting things there. Um, and then for like uh, recording technique stuff, uh, a company called Melda Production has a free effects bundle that's cross-platform. Um, I'll type the, the name in uh, in the chat, um, but they're excellent. Um, those are two that I recommend to a lot of people just to get started. Um, some of my favorite plugins are, uh, well, Valhalla DSP. Uh, they're so inexpensive and they're ridiculously awesome. Reverbs and delays. Um, I'll type that in. And then um, Waves plugins used to be really expensive and now they seem to have a sale like once a month and um, they make some great compressors. A lot of it's modeling, like modeled on old analog outboard gear. Um, so yeah, I'll get an email from them every once in a while and they're having some ridiculous sale and I'll go buy a couple things. So those are kind of my two big ones. Plus I use a lot of software instruments. Um, I use a lot of synthesizers made by Archeria. Um, they do modeling and it's synthesizers plus pianos and electric keyboards and just all kinds of keyboard instruments that those are my favorite things. They're a little bit uh, heavy on the CPU usage, but I like them a lot. I don't have a ton of experience with plugins other than kind of the stock ones that I use on the software that I have. And I, my, my rationale was there is for me personally being like a, you know, acoustic guitar, uh, songwriter type dude, the, the, uh, I have to learn more before I'm going to get a bunch of plugins to fix whatever it is I think I need. So I kind of feel like it, it, once I, once I know exactly what, my current compressors capabilities are or my current reverbs are i'm gonna i haven't really explored a ton of the plugins yet like though they're pretty good and then if if there's a need then oh okay you know i'll try to i'll try to do that i think i've had some you know some drum uh samples that i've that i've downloaded and and i you know and i'll use some of those just because they're a different sound and i find that i can't on a computer drum like on the software there, I can't like EQ to get a cool sound. I have to have loops that are already sounding like I want them to sound. And so there's, I, you know, I have like an easy drummer program there too. I have a, a little Novation um, circuit drum machine, which I really like because it's got knobs and I can di dial in a sound that I like because my sounds are pretty simple. So, um, but as far as, so as far as plugins, I, I'm kind of actually interested to take a look at those but for me I, I know what I get like and I'll spend two weeks trying to figure out what plugin to buy when I could have written three songs by then and so I, I kind of I, ha I have to really die like wait what am what am I doing like do I need do I need this you know do I need this piece do I need this software or is it better to get a good acoustic guitar sound with what I have and write the song. So I'm kind of a, at this point, a non-plug-in kind of guy, so. Yeah, you should keep that up. Um, <laughs> there's a, a real tendency towards people to, it's a slippery slope for uh, gear lust and software updates and, you know, instead of just focusing on the music you make. <laughs> Now I wanna be respectful of everyone's time because we are at noon, um, but I also see we have a few more questions. So um, if if you have to go, I totally understand that. And if, does do people have time for a couple more questions? Okay, well, um, here's an interesting one, the, the age old question, uh, Mac or PC? Um, so, I, I use both, um, but 98% of my professional work is with Mac. Um, there are going to be an infinite number of pros and cons for using both. Um, the reality is um, it, it, if it's coming down to price, if price is your biggest priority, then I'm always gonna recommend a PC. And I started doing all of my music career originally on PC and then I shifted to Mac 
and I've been on Mac for almost eight years now. And I'm not going to lie, I am running Mac and PC simultaneously right now, and my PC has been pretty stable, which has not been my experience in the past. Um, and so since stability is kind of my number one priority, um, I've stayed on Mac. Now I'm putting the paces onto my PC with my creative work, and I still haven't run into any issues yet, whereas maybe I would have in the past. So there tends to be a lot of difference that was previously there that is no longer there, I feel. And especially as you see uh, PC laptops and desktops now having Thunderbolt 3 ports, which in my opinion is going to be the future. And so it's no longer just Macs that have them. So I think the gap that used to be there in reliability is definitely no longer as big as it was. It might still be there a little bit. We'll see. Um, but for cost to benefit ratio, I still absolutely vote PC. But if you have the money to step up to a, a, um, a high-end Mac, I do think that you get a ton of value out of it. It just, you have to deal with the sticker shock. Uh, yeah, I run Macs, um, but mostly that's because when I first started using Pro Tools, um, you couldn't run it on a PC. And so it's just, you know, a lot of the software I think wasn't usable on a PC. Um, however, I think even now though, the, the new OS on Mac, you still have to kind of maximize it whenever you're using software, audio software, because they've added a lot more uh, just kind of like dumbing down things, like a lot of automatic things running in the background um, that take up CPU power. Um, so, I still run Mac, but I have to like go into the preferences and turn things off sometimes and stuff like that. So um, yeah, I, the new Macs are ridiculously expensive. Um, I actually just bought this 2009 Mac Pro uh, two years ago. So it's, you know, it's still working great. So if you want a Mac, consider finding a used refurbished one. Um, you'll have to make sure that it is compatible with everything you want to use though. I am a PC guy. That's just kind of my my uh, landscape that I'm familiar with. So when I started doing this, that's the computer I had. And so before I knew, like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to go drop all that money for something I may or may not continue. And then it's just been a, you know, it's just been kind of PC ever since just because I don't, that's what I'm familiar with. And I've been happy with it. It hasn't, uh, you know, it hasn't bogged me down or done anything more than any other computer, I don't think. And again, I'm not running a ton of plugins and a ton of different things. I think when you get into that category of recording, the, the Mac might be your kind of your more reliable go-to thing. But I mean, I think it's the, it's the computer you have now that is the one that you should start with. And then, um, so you can limit the investment, but I would consider, making sure that whatever I, you know, if there's a US, if there's an interface that can work for both and a software that can work for both, that's the one you should, those are the things you should get if there's the possibility that you're going to switch. Because if you switch and all of a sudden you need a new interface and you need a new software, that's a, that's a problem. So whatever, you know, try to get the universal things so that you can uh, more seamlessly make a, make a switch if you need to. Wonderful, thank you all. Uh, another question, where do you find the proper curtain drops for your space? I guess I'll take that one. Uh, and, to, and to again remind Kyle that they are in fact curtains. Um, these, uh, there's nothing special about them. These, these uh, we ordered on Amazon. So um, I went there and I, I got a, you know, you just have to, I, and I don't know off the top of my head, they're a, they're a thicker, they're a thicker curtain. They're not a soundproof curtain, but they got some, they have some mass to them. And then we have nine foot ceilings down here. So we made sure to get the, the nine foot curtains. And then I went to, you know, Home Depot and bought a curtain rod and, and, and put them up. So we just ordered them. They came two days later, like, let's see if we can, like, so there's just a, curtain rod screwed to the ceiling and those things are 
kind of hung right up there. You can see my fake wall leaning against the beam in the back. It's kind of nice, you know. Wait, I better um, adjust that. Keep it, keep it so people can't see the fake wall. There we go. And I want to say too, um, the the type of the type of curtain that I used when I had it in my home in my home studio um, were blackout curtains. So those curtains that are made to block out the sunlight, they're just made with a thicker, denser material of some kind that is is not soundproof by any means, but it does a better job than just like a traditional curtain, which is usually pretty thin. Um, so I've always found that blackout curtains specifically tend to work better for that kind of purpose and they block out the light so it makes it look more like a studio. I don't really have much to add to that. <laughs> Great. All right. Uh, another question. Uh, someone said, I saw something where you pay $12 a month to use everything under the sun. What is your take on something like that? Um, well, I know Leslie actually touched on this with the Pro Tools thing. Um, this does kind of seem to be the, the uh, target for a lot of places. There is Splice, um, which is a, a place where you can spend, I think it's like $10 a month and you get access to a bunch of samples. You get a bunch of sample credits. Um, Waves um, and a couple of other plugin uh, companies that I use their plugins for also offer a subscription service. Um, the very popular orchestral sample library uh, maker East West also has a composer cloud where you pay $200 a year, I think, or something like that, and you get access to a bunch of different sounds. Um, it does kind of tend to be the, the way that things are, are going right now is this subscription service. Um, and I'm gonna say that I am a huge fan of not using any of these services. Um, I use Ableton because I bought Ableton and I own Ableton. And even if Ableton were to go to a new version and uh, you know it makes it so that it's subscription only, I still own this version of Ableton Live. The challenge that I have with the subscription service becomes once you stop paying, you no longer have the ability to use that thing that you've uh, paid for, for who knows how long. Um, so the companies that do these subscription services, I always look to see if they have the ability for me to purchase what they're offering as a subscription. And if they don't, you know, like Adobe, not to call out anyone in particular, um, but I currently pay um, for uh, software by other companies specifically to avoid paying for Adobe. Because if I stop paying, I can no longer use my Photoshop images or my Illustrator edits or any of these other things. So I'm not a big fan of subscription services is the, the kind of the, the point of this. Um, and it's, that's what's kept me away from Pro Tools for most of my music career. Yeah, I think the other problem with that um, is that you get these continual upgrades as well. And um, if you aren't, like if your hardware isn't compatible or other softwares you're using isn't compatible with the upgrades, then you've, you're forced to upgrade everything. Um, it's gonna be really expensive in the long run. Um, I wish that they would, like I can understand this for people who are um, really full-time engineers, um, producers, they always want the latest thing. They just pay a monthly fee and it's always there. Um, but for people who are more hobbyists or projects or musicians with home studios, there isn't much of a middle ground anymore. Um, there are free versions of things, but they only get you so far. Like I, I think there's a free Pro Tools right now, but um, it's probably really limited on your capability. So um, I, I'm not sure if you can still buy Pro Tools 12, but that's what I run because it's the last one before the subscription started. Yeah, I, I don't know other than maybe maybe it would be okay to learn something. Um, you know, give yourself a do 12 bucks a month for two months and get in there and play with all the stuff and find out what you like and what's a what's a neat thing or what you need and 
you might find like, oh my God, all this, like what would happen to me is I'd find all this stuff and I wouldn't know there's too much of it and I wouldn't know what to do with it. So it wouldn't be good for me, you know, but you might find, oh, like I really like this thing and I really like that thing. Those, that's a cool thing. Then stop your subscription and go buy those two things and, and do it that way. That seems like a, a, a way to use the subscription based stuff is to learn a little bit and then go get your own thing. All right. Well, thank you all so much, Leslie, Kyle, and Mike. I really appreciate your time today and all of your insights. Um, I found them fascinating and I'm sure that our attendees did as well. And um, I wanted to make sure everyone sees the feedback survey in the group chat, if you could take a minute to um, fill that out. And I also want to remind everyone that registration is open for the Minnesota Music Summit. We hope that we will see you there online um, in June and uh, that you can find that on our website. Um, there are also currently submission opportunities open for the Demo-Rama and for, um, uh, for artists at the summit. Uh, so yeah, all that information is on our website and um, maybe, oh, and great. And I was hoping that um, one of our team would put uh, the link there and she did. So thank you so much everyone for being here. Have a great rest of your day.